So let me start by introducing myself. My name is Evren Siren. I'm one of the startup founders and the chief scientist. So today uh, we'll talk about the basics of RDF data validation and talk about why it is important. Uh, we will go over the core features of the Shekel constraint language and explain how Shekel validation interacts with reasoning. Uh, I will show a quick demo of the Stardog's integrity constraint validation capability and also discuss on-demand validation versus transactional validation. So, okay, let's start with the quick motivation. So, as you know, RDF is the core data modeling language used for knowledge graphs. And the main use case we see for knowledge graphs is to connect disparate data sources. Knowledge graphs make it easier to unify data from different schemas due to the flexibility they provide. In a classical relational model, data is represented in rows and columns. The links between entities are represented as foreign key relationships between the tables. The structure is very rigid and cannot be changed easily uh, dynamically. In contrast, graph models provide a lot of freedom as to how nodes are linked to each other, making it suitable for highly connected uh, and constantly evolving data. But as any software developer can tell you, having a lot of flexibility makes errors more likely to. The contrast between strongly typed and weakly typed programming languages comes to mind, where weak typing makes the code more flexible, but might cause some errors to be missed at development time and eventually lead to runtime failures. Strong typing, on the other hand, gives you guarantees about correctness, but then you have to use things like typecasting to work around the rigidity of strong typing. So with, when it comes to data modeling and validation, we have a similar situation where we are trying to find the sweet spot between having a flexible data model and the ability to validate data model. And now let's look at an actual RDF graph and see what kind of validation functionality we need. Uh, and here we see a small snippet from a larger music data set. In this music graph, we have nodes representing musicians, albums, and songs. For example, there's a node representing the band The Beatles, nodes representing its members, one of their studio albums, and a song from that album. Uh, we also have here some data values like strings, numbers, and dates, for example. Uh, we see the length of the La Midu song is 125 seconds. The release date of the Please Please Me album is March 22nd, 1963. So uh, we might have an RDF schema that describes the classes and the properties we have in this graph. For example, we can define an artist class as the super classes of band and solo artists. Uh, using the RDFS subclass of property. Uh, in RDFS, we can also declare domain and ranges for properties. And we'll talk about this in more detail in an upcoming slide. So since uh, in the RDF uh, stack, we have schema languages like RDFS and OWL, the web ontology language that have been standardized by uh, W3C, it seems attractive to use these languages for validation purposes. So one can be inclined to define constraints using RDFS and or OWL and use a reasoner to detect inconsistencies. There are clear semantics defined in these standards about what an inconsistency is. And you can find various tools and reasoners, including Stardog, that implement these semantics. So let's see an example how this would work in practice. So suppose we want to ensure that album and song nodes in our graph are disjoint. We want to detect or prevent the case that a node, like the Imagine node you see here, is both declared to be an album as a song, because we want two separate nodes, one for the song and one for the album. They are distinct entities. 
So we can use the our language construct disjoint with to declare that the album and song classes are disjoint. And when we uh, load this to our uh, database and use a reasoner, any inconsistency will be detected. So in this example, the uh, validation condition that we want uh, would be checked and it works. But let's look at another example where we want to ensure that the uh, property name track will connect albums to the songs. Uh, we can use RDFS domain and RDFS range declarations for the property. And then suppose we have one more triple in our graph that says, please, please, miss link to Lamy, do via the track property. Now, if we uh, use this example with a, a RDFS or an OWL reasoner, we wouldn't have any inconsistency detected because the semantics of uh, RDFS and OWL doesn't work that way. So instead of uh, finding a violation, a reasoner would actually infer that please, please me is a type and la me do is a song just because they have been used with the track property. So instead of a validation error, a violation, we would get additional inferences instead. And that's where the Shekel language comes into play as a relatively new specification from uh, W3C. So Shekel is an RDF vocabulary to define constraints over RDF graphs for the purpose of validating the cons contents of the, that graph. So the building block of shekel is the notion of a shape. Each shape has some constraints associated with it, and shapes also define their target nodes for validation. So the validation process checks if the target nodes conform to the constraints defined for that shape. And we look at a smaller uh, subset of the music graph to see how shekel validation works and what kind of constraints we can define. So here uh, uh, on the right hand side, uh, you are seeing a turtle serialization of shekel shape definitions. So we could have used a graph visualization for the shapes graph, just like the data graph on the left hand side, but we'll keep them separate and use this turtle serialization. And uh, basically go over the shape definition line by line to see uh, what kind of constraints are defined and how the validation would work. So in the first line, we have a shekel shape de declaration straightforward. Um, by the way, we omitted the prefix declaration here, uh, but the sh prefix you see in the slide is tied to the standard shekel namespace. So the second line defines the target for this shape. And there are several different ways to define the targets of a, a shekel shape. For example, you can define the subjects of a specific property as targets. Uh, but most typically, the target definition uses a class, as in this example. And defining a class as the target of a shape means any node in the graph that has the specified type album in this example will be a target for this shape. So validation process for this shape would start with the target node, uh, which is the please please me node in our data graph because it has uh, album as its type. So in Shekel, uh, there is also the notion of a focus node. So basically when validation starts with the target node, target node becomes the focus of validation. It's called a focus node. And uh, initially also your focus node is your value node too. And value nodes are uh, what the constraints apply to. So now let's look at the next line, uh, line three, where we have a constraint definition. Uh, this constraint is using the sh not constraint and uh, shekel not is a form of negation. 
And this constraint says that our value node should not satisfy the shape specified as the argument. And the argument of our not constraint here is actually an anonymous shape here, as indicated by the square brackets uh, enclosing the uh, B node triples. And inside the anonymous shape, we say the constraint using SH class property. So the SH class constraint says the value node should have the specified type. And so if we read this constraint overall, we are requiring our value node, please, please me, not satisfy the type sum. So in other words, uh, we have used the combination of not and class constraints to define a disjointness between uh, album and song classes. And if we move to the next line, now we see a property shape link to the album shape. So SH property is pointing to uh, what is called a property shape. And again, we are using a B node for our property shape here. And property shapes change uh, the value node in the uh, validation process by specifying a path from the current focus node to a new value node. So here the path is defined to be the track property. So now uh, our value node will be la midu node, which is connected to our focus node, please, please me. And all the constraints defined in the property shape will be applied to the la midu uh, node. And uh, by the way, in Shekel, there are different ways to define paths between nodes. So using an IRI, as in this example, is the simplest way. Uh, but you can use more complex paths like Sparkle property paths uh, to define, uh, to connect uh, shapes to each other. So inside this property shape, we have another class constraint. Uh, which says our value node, which is la midu in this case, should have the type sum. And in our data graph, that type actually exists, so this constraint would be satisfied. And, uh, but now effectively what we have done is uh, defining a range constraint uh, using this property shape, uh, requiring the uh, values of the track property to always have a specific type. But unlike an RDFS range declaration that we have seen before, uh, this constraint would be violated if the type triple is missing. So unlike RDFS and OWL, here we are getting constraint uh, violations. We would get constraint violations instead of new inferences. Okay, next constraint we see in this property shape is a min count constraint. So count constraints are not about actually a specific value node. Instead, they're about the set of all the value nodes reachable from the focus node. And the min count says that that set should have at least one element. So for our focus node, please, please me, there's only a single node reachable by the path, the track property. So this constraint would be satisfied because there's at least one node. Um, let's look at the next property shape attached to our album shape. Uh, this time the value nodes are reached via the date property. So the date value that you see here becomes our new value node for the context of this property shape. And at line 11, we have uh, the a data type constraint, which is another form of a range constraint uh, in Sheko. But this time, uh, we are requiring the nodes reachable by the date property uh, to be a literal, and that literal to have the XSD date, data type. 
So if please, please me was connected to a date which is not a literal or the literal does not have the XSD date, uh, data type, uh, that would be a violation in that case. Uh, we have a mean count constraint for the date shape as well, which is uh, similar to the uh, previous one, but there's also a max count constraint for dates. And this uh, max count works similar like mean count, but this time we are restrict restricting the maximum number of nodes reachable by uh, the path. So in this case, we want each album to have one and only one uh, release date associated with it. So we have defined both a mean count constraint and a max count constraint. Okay, so these are some of the uh, commonly used shekel constraint types. But actually in the specification, there are many more kinds of constraint types that you can use in your shapes. And most of them are uh, quite straightforward, like specifying a maximum value for a numeric property uh, or comparing different property values uh, in your graphs. And whenever the expressivity of these built-in constraints are not sufficient, you also have the option of attaching a sparkle query to your shapes as a uh, shekel constraint as well. So you have a lot of flexibility as to how you can define these constraints and how you can uh, restrict the uh, shapes of your graph through uh, shekel constraints. So, in the shekel specification, in addition to these constraint uh, types, there's also a definition of what the validation results will look like. And validation results themselves are represented in RDF as well. So here in this slide, we have a simplified version of the album shape. Uh, the difference you'll notice here is instead of an anonymous property shape, now we are using an IRI to identify the album date shape. So the meaning of the constraints does not change, but now there's an explicit IRI that refers to the property shape. And as you can see in our sample data graph, uh, the date value uh, in this example is not using the correct data type. So the, this, uh, the data type constraint for the date value is violated. And as, as a result, a shekel uh, validator would generate a validation result. So a validation result uh, will have several uh, fields, like it will uh, refer to the source shape, in this case, album date shape is our source. And that's the reason that we have used an IRI instead of a B node. Uh, otherwise, in your shekel validation results, you would just get a B node, which would be much harder to map to the actual shapes in your definition. Uh, there's a source constraint component saying a data type constraint was violated in this case. And then the focus node, result path, and the value is basically giving us the triple that caused the validation error. Uh, in your shekel shapes, you can describe a, a message that will be attached to validation results. In this case, we haven't used a, a message. So uh, Stardog validator, for example, would create an automated message in this case, so it says value must have type XSD date, but as we see here, the value is using a different data type. Okay, let's look another uh, validation result example. So we have the same uh, simplified album shape example. We have the max count constraint here, but in our data graph, we have two distinct date values. Uh, associated with the album. Now, the validation result structure looks very similar. Source constraints component now says it's a max count constraint that was violated. Uh, 
Um, there is also not a value node in this validation result, as you can notice, because as we mentioned before, count constraints are not about a single value node. So uh, you won't get a value node for the violations of count constraints. Okay, so now let's switch to uh, Stardog Studio, the, the development environment for Stardog, to see uh, how these uh, constraints and how validation uh, works in practice. So right now I'm connected to a Stardog server. You can see on the lower button uh, of the screen that uh, I have a Stardog server running in the background. Uh, I have an empty database that I created. It's called Webinar. Uh, there's a default namespace associated with this database, uh, which is the namespace we use for our tutorials and webinars. And uh, now I will open a directory that contains some sample data and sample constraints. So here on the left-hand side, we are seeing the contents of that directory. And this is a, a GitHub repo called Stardog Tutorials. I'll share the uh, link with you after the demo. Uh, so you can check out this GitHub repo yourself too and get the uh, data files and the constraints here. So under this shekel directory, there is a, a data file uh, called invalid.ttl, uh, which is looks like the uh, music graph that I have shown at the beginning, but we have introduced some uh, validation errors on purpose here, like multiple date values, using the incorrect type for length, and so on. And I will uh, first load this data into my uh, webinar database. So there are no uh, constraints so far, so uh, the data is loaded without any problems. And here in this directory, I also have a definition of shekel shapes, uh, which looks like the examples we have seen, like the album shape you can see here. Uh, but it has some more details. It has shapes defined for songs, uh, and artists, bands, and so on as well. So right now, we open this file just as a regular turtle file. But if you go to the uh, right bottom uh, panel here, you can change this type of file to be shekel. And now you'll notice that the shekel uh, vocabulary is highlighted in a bold font. So in this shekel mode, the editor in Studio uh, is aware that you are uh, editing the shekel constraints and will provide uh, syntax completion, auto-completion, and syntax highlighting uh, based on that. So one thing that's uh, additional in this uh, shape definitions is uh, the notion of linking two shapes through the node constraint. So here, for example, we have a shape for artists. The target is the artist class. And it's referring to the name shape as another constraint that the value node should satisfy. The name shape itself is, does not have a target, so it wouldn't be used for validation by itself, but it's defining a property shape for the name property, uh, requiring to have at least one name value and that name value to be of string data type. And you are seeing that we are reusing the name shape for artists, albums, and songs. So this is a kind of an import mechanism in some sense. So we are applying the constraints defined for name shape in these uh, different shapes uh, that have different targets. Okay, so 
since this is a turtle file, I can add it directly to my database. So it would be part of the instance data as well and would still be used for validation. But in startup, we also have the notion of adding the, uh, these as constraints. And when I click add as constraint, this will be stored as part of the system database. So if you write a Sparkle query against your database, for example, you wouldn't get the uh, shape definitions as a result. Uh, as I said, you have the option of storing the shapes along with your data, maybe using a named graph. Uh, uh, but you also have the option of separating your constraints from your data uh, too. And uh, so now we have our data in our database, uh, constraints added as well. So I can uh, click the validate button here uh, to get the shekel validation results for our uh, data graph using these shekel constraints. So a shekel uh, validation returns a validation report. So at the beginning we have this uh, B node that says there's a validation report and uh, the instance graph, the data graph does not conform to the uh, constraints in our shapes. So this is just a Boolean value to indicate if there were any violations or not. And then you see the list of validation results that have been computed. So these are similar to the examples we have seen before. Uh, like let me do is uh, violating the data type constraint. It was supposed to be an integer, but this is a decimal value, not an integer value. There is the more than one date values for the album, uh, so on and so forth. But as you notice here, I mean, we have the invalid data loaded into our database. And we have done what we call an on-demand validation. We have uh, now getting these validation results and we have the option of fixing these validation errors or leaving it in there uh, if uh, uh, you'd like to allow that invalid data uh, to be stored in your database. But in some use cases, we will want to have uh, invalid data uh, not to be loaded into your database at all. So I'll create a new database here to demonstrate the transactional validation capability. So I'll call this database a strict database. Uh, I'll take this offline and enable the integrity constraint validation feature. So when I uh, enable this, save the changes and bring the database online. Now this database will always, oh, I did it for the webinar database by mistake. Okay, so let's do it for the strict database, enable AIC validation. Okay, let's do it again, enable this, save changes, bring the database online. Now uh, let's add these constraints to our strict database. Uh, so add these as constraint to the strict database. And if I run validation now, we have no instances. This is an empty database. So we get a validation report that says uh, the database conforms to the constraints. But if I try to add this invalid data into my database, now uh, you'll notice an error message saying that the data failed to add. Here in studio, we are not seeing the reason for the validation error. That's something we will add in a, a future version, but I'll now switch to the start of server logs where you will actually see a validation result uh, uh, printed as the uh, reason for the failure in the transaction. And here it's just showing the first validation error that was found, allow me to uh, length property does not satisfy the integer value. 
So now Stardog is not allowing us to add the invalid data. So there's a valid version of this data that doesn't have multiple date values using the correct uh, data types. Now, if I try to add this data though, there will still be an error here. And let's go back to our log, uh, which will have the, uh, oh, this was the webinar database. So I'm trying to add the valid data to the strict database. And now the error message is different. And now it's saying that please, please me is connected to the Beatles node through the artist type, but uh, the value node, the Beatles does not have the artist type. So in our uh, shapes, the album artist shape requires the artist type, but in our valid data, we have just defined uh, the Beatles to be a band and not as an artist explicitly. But as I mentioned at the very beginning, we might have a, a schema associated with our data. And in this case, in this repo, we have a music schema, which has the definition for the band class. And it says it's a subclass of artists. So if I can add this uh, schema to my database first, and then when I try to add the valid data, it will succeed because the validation process using reasoning figured out that the Beatles being a band and band being a subclass satisfies the artist constraint we have defined. So using the combination of uh, RDFS and OWL schemas to do inference and shekel validation, shekel shapes to do the validation, we can uh, do validation over inferred uh, triples in our database. And in uh, Stardock, you have the option of enabling reasoning uh, versus disabling reasoning for validation. So if you want to ignore all your inferences during validation, that's also an option you can do via the configuration options. Okay, so let me uh, go back to my slides. Uh, as I mentioned, the data files, the example shapes are all available on GitHub. So you can check out this repo and try these uh, on your own, see the details of the shapes and constraints. And if you like, we have additional tutorials on our website about RDF, Sparkle, and virtual graphs. Uh, so you can uh, learn more about the details of uh, other functionalities Stardog supports. Uh, you can uh, download Stardog and Stardog Studio and uh, play with some of the other features that Stardog offers like the GraphQL queries or virtual gra graphs or connecting to tools like the Tableau uh, analytics application. And so, okay, so that kind of covers uh, the main topics for today's uh, webinar. Uh, I'll now take a look at some of the questions and uh, answer the questions you have. Uh, let me switch to the... and a few, just a second. Okay, I'm still not being able to see the questions. I see there are some questions there. Uh, okay, I think I need to, sorry about this. Okay, if you have questions and just 
put it on the chat channel maybe because I'm not being able to open the Q&A view right now and we'll get to those questions, uh, send answers to those questions after the webinar, but uh, if you can paste questions, okay, I see some questions here. What about using SH node in a proper shape? Does Stardot propagate the constraints to neighbors of the focus node? Yes, I mean, the whole uh, point of Shekel is to use combination of constraints. So if you put an SH node inside a proper shape, then those constraints will be applied to the neighbors. And you can have any levels of nesting as you want. Uh, but cycles are not allowed, so you cannot have cyclic references through the node uh, constraints. Instead, you would use different targets for uh, to avoid the cycles. Okay, doesn't SH target class album already imply that SH not class song? I don't say. Okay, so this is. Uh, there is no requirement in RDF that a node will have a single type. So just because you say that a node is of type album doesn't actually exclude it from being described as a node. That's kind of the flexibility you get. So you can assign multiple types to a node like that. So you would need an actual constraint to make sure uh, that's not happening as we did here. Uh, can I replace all use of spin with Stardot's shekel, even though shekel rules not available in Stardot? Uh, we support uh, all of the shekel uh, standard, the core features. Shekel rules is not part of the recommendation and we don't support it right now, but uh, we support everything else in the uh, shekel specification, so you should be able to uh, use it for uh, if you have existing shekel descriptions. There is uh, just something about a specific thing called ask validators we don't support. It's mentioned in our documentation. Uh, validation is certainly important, says the next question, but could shekel not also be used as a modeling tool defining the basic structure of a knowledge graph? Yes, I mean, you certainly have the, once you define your shape definitions, you can use it for purposes other than validation as well. Uh, you can use it for documentation purposes or use it to kind of guide the uh, maybe UI widgets you are building around your graph. That's certainly possible. Uh, it's not limited to validation. Validation is the main uh, use case for Shekel, but once you have that structure in place, you can use it for other uh, purposes. Is the shekel validation feature available programmatically from Java? Yes, everything you have seen here is you can do it through Java, through our command line interface, or using the HTTP REST interface uh, directly. Uh, do you have plans for graphical tools for the design of shekel graphs? Uh, we are thinking about that. There will be some additional visualization capabilities that's coming out in Studio very soon. It's not going to cover the shekel uh, shapes yet, uh, but that's something we are considering, uh, considering as our next steps. And last questions, can shekel replace reasoning? Um, not in a straightforward way. Uh, that's not what the specification is about. There's shekel rules, as I mentioned, uh, which is not part of the specification. It's a note uh, written by the working group. So that's for the reasoning part of the problem. But otherwise, shekel constraints, as they are defined in the specification, is not for reasoning purposes. 